Uh, y'all can y'all can smile today. It's, it's it's a good day, isn't it? It's a good day. Somebody say, "I'm happy in the Lord." Yes, in Jesus' name, man. If you're not happy in the Lord, there's something bad wrong. Hallelujah. Palm Sunday. Man, it seems like we just did this, didn't it? And here we are again, Palm Sunday. And uh, I heard somebody the other day talking about Palm Sunday, and they said, what is Palm Sunday? They said, that's the Sunday you go to church, when they give you the little branches to wave around, and you play with them till your mama takes them away from you, makes you sit down. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of true. That's kind of true. That's pretty much Palm Sunday. Um, from our perspective, but uh, Palm Sunday is actually uh, the beginning of, of what a lot of uh, people would call Holy Week. Um, we don't necessarily call it Holy Week because we believe every day is holy. And we believe that we should live a holy life at all times. Amen, amen. That holiness is a part of our walk, our daily walk. And it's not something that we just do in a particular week or a particular time so that we can uh, claim that we did something or whatever, but we live it at all times. It is holiness. And holiness is not about a lot of externals. If you grew up in holiness religion, not church, in holiness religion, it was a lot of externals. But when you grow up in holiness church, you understand that holiness is relationship. And holiness, true holiness, let me just kind of define it for you so that you quit worrying about do you look right? Do you dress right? Do you got the right makeup or no makeup or hair cut or not cut or whatever else that the, you know, the, the holiness church put us all through, uh, the holiness religion put us through. The real truth of holiness is when your insides and your outsides match. It's when you live what you say you live. And when you live it according to the Word of God. Amen? I want to be able to go home at night and put my head on the pillow and know that I didn't lie to somebody. No, I didn't cheat anybody. No, I didn't steal from somebody. No, I didn't hate somebody without just cause. No, I didn't commit adultery somewhere. Come on, y'all talk to me. That's what I want to be able to do is go home and put my head on the pillow at night and know that my insides match my outsides. Amen? That's real holiness. That's true holiness. Holy week. Everybody say holy week. It's, it's kind of a big deal in a lot of people's minds, but it's when we recall the events that were leading up to the crucifixion and uh, according to uh, our faith, of course, the resurrection. And uh, the resurrection is more important than the crucifixion, but without the crucifixion, there could have been no resurrection. So it's important that we understand and acknowledge both of them, but the reality is what we hang everything we believe on is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And how many of you know he lives? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And Come on, because he lives, all my fear is gone. And because he lives. Yeah. We used to sing a song that says, I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds my hand. Because he is alive and he walks with me every day. He walks with me and he talks with me. Come on, somebody. And it's a good thing to have a relationship with a living God whose name is Jesus Christ. Come on. 
and, and have that, uh, that walk with him so that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt who I am in him. Amen? So this week includes uh, several days of, of significance. And the first is our Palm Sunday, which we commemorate this whole uh, humble entry uh, of Jesus on a donkey into Jerusalem. And uh, I just want to throw some things out there for you uh, to think about today. And we're going to read from Matthew 21. And uh, it's in all four of the Gospels, uh, the three synoptic Gospels. And then, of course, it's in John's Gospel as well. But you want to uh, check the story out, read it, understand it a little bit. But I'm going to give you some points here today that I think will help you in your understanding of what this was all about and uh, maybe reach a little further than we have before and maybe tap into some of the old prophecies of the Old Testament that will bear out what this is all about. Amen? So I'm going to talk about, uh, start about uh, the first verse here in chapter 21 of Matthew. When they had approached Jerusalem, they is Jesus and the disciples, and they had come to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, first of all, let me just tell you this, that from what I understand, the way this is all laid out in a, a geographic uh, situation is that Bethpage and Mount of Olives is east of Jerusalem. So Jesus would be coming from the east of Jerusalem. Are you with me? And so it's important that you kind of understand some of this because when you read some of the prophetic books, and uh, how many of you have been still hanging on to that reading through the Bible in 90 days? And uh, some of us have finished it. Some of us are still there. Some of us are a, a couple days behind. And some of us quit a long time ago. But you can pick back up and uh, you can continue it. And it's, it's actually, y'all can smile, can't you? You can smile. Just smile. Just smile, yeah. It's okay if you messed up, if you didn't do it, if you didn't keep up with it. It's okay. You can always go back and redo it again. It doesn't matter. You don't have to do it the same time I do it. <laughs> just do it. Amen? Just, just get into the Word. And a great way to do it, a great way to really help you is to put it on an app. Get the Bible on an app. And how many of you can connect your Bluetooth to your car? So you can listen in your car. Y'all can wave at me. You're like, what is Bluetooth? Well, ask your grandkids. Ask the nine-year-old. They will tell you. The five-year-old. They will tell you. They'll fix it for you. They'll set it up. Okay, Grandma? <laughs> they will hook you up, and they will have your car working before you can get it figured out. I can tell you. Because they already know everything about it. But it's interesting. Uh that you can and and you can put it on and you can listen to it and I don't know about y'all but I'm kind of an audible learner so I like to listen and read at the same time and I like to just listen sometimes so a lot of times when I go to the gym I will put on scripture or I will put on a book that I'm listening to or I'll put on something because I learn audibly I learn by hearing and it's really good to hear the word of God because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if you will listen to the word, not, you'll, you'll do several things at one time. You will increase your faith and you will cut off a bunch of negative stuff that you shouldn't have been listening to, like news. <laughs> like... Like, like all kind of other stuff. You don't need to be listening to everybody's podcast on Facebook and 
all that kind of stuff and, and, and the, the things that people are saying that just get you upset. And, and don't, don't take your fight to Facebook. Good grief. Come on, Christians. Stand up and be a Christ-like. And don't take your fights to Facebook. And don't uh, get on there and, and, and get entangled in all that mess. But put on the Word of God. Put on the Word of God and listen to it. Listen to the Word of God as you're going about your day, as you're driving down the street. And if you really are uh, really good at, at listening, uh, sometimes you can speed it up a little bit. Like I do mine on like 1.5 instead of just 1 because it's a little slow when they talk. And I just, I, it's hard for me to look at the scripture and stay with them because I read past them while they're talking. So I have to speed it up a little bit so I can talk with it. <laughs> you understand? So you can, and, and consequently, it doesn't take as much time. And you can get through it, amen? But there's some things that when you're reading the Bible that you'll catch in prophetic utterances that are really interesting. Like if you look in Ezekiel and you read the 10th chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw the presence and the glory of the Lord being lifted up over the east gate of the tabernacle and the temple, and then it moved out to the east. And it moved away, and the glory of the Lord departed from the tabernacle. There are moments when God's people were so disobedient and so not connected to what he was doing that he said, I can't waste my time being here with them. I will go and do what else I need to do and not have to waste my time here. And the Bible says that he departed. You know, sometimes I feel like that in churches, we just get so used to singing three songs. We sing two fast songs and then one slow song. And then we have the announcements, and then we take the offering, and we just do everything at such a normal pace and a normal thing that God said, oh, they're just doing the same thing. Let me just go over here and help somebody else. And sometimes the glory of the Lord departs, and we don't even know that it departed because we're having church. And we've learned how to have church. It's scary, but we've learned how to have church with or without God. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. But that's a scary thought. That we would be having church and God wouldn't even be present. I talked to a pastor not too long ago that told me, he said, it never dawned on me that I was supposed to be at church and God was supposed to be there too until you started talking to me about that. And I said, what do you do at church? He said, we have church. I said, how do you have church without the presence of God? I don't know about y'all, but I want to be like Moses. God, if you're going to send us, don't send us unless you're going. Don't take me there unless you're going to be there. Because I can't do this without you. I need you, and I need you every day. I don't just need you on Holy Week. I need you every day. I need you every Sunday. I need you every Monday. I need you every Tuesday. I need you on Wednesday. And God come Thursday and Friday, I sure enough need you. I need you real good then because I'm trying to get ready back again for another Sunday that's coming. God, I don't want to do anything on a Sunday without you. I don't know about y'all, but I don't want to do anything without God. And the Bible talks about in Ezekiel how that the glory of the Lord departed. But by the time he gets over to the 43rd chapter of Ezekiel, y'all go read this later. I'm not going to bore you with, by turning there, but you can, you can go and check it all out. But the 43rd chapter, I think it is, of Ezekiel, by the time he comes, he, the glory of the Lord is coming back to the temple. But he is coming from the east 
Now, I think that this was a precursor because when he comes to his temple, he straightens things up. I think this is a precursor possibly to what we're seeing Jesus do right here. He is east of Jerusalem. He is east of the temple. And he's saying, there's a little village over here, just opposite of where we are. You got to go down. The, the word opposite means down below in the, in the Greek. And it and he said, there's a little village over there, and there's a donkey over there, and she's tied up, but she's got a foal with her. If you will go and just tell them that you have need, that the master has need of the donkey, then, and, and, and in some ways, there was a, there was a uh, tradition that if an important person or an important, uh, especially someone who was considered a prophet or a... Uh, man of God, if they came to you and said they needed to borrow something that you had, you gave it without question. That was, that was normal in Israel. So in, in Jesus just saying, hey, go down and tell them that the master has need of them, has need of these donkeys, he's, uh, uh, the little foal, he's, what he is telling them is I am positioning myself as to who I really am now. I'm telling you that as the man of God, I need to borrow your animal and just give it to me. And so that's what happened. They give the animal. And what's really interesting is this is also a very prophetic verse. It's a very prophetic happening. If you were to go to, uh, let, me just, let me just read this one to you. Uh, I'm going to read, it's Zechariah 9, verse 9, I think. Somebody say amen. amen. So what's this? Yeah. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. What were the kids doing? They were shouting. What were the people doing when he's coming into town? They're shouting. Hang with me. We're going to get there. He says, shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, but humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is Zechariah 9.9. This is hundreds of years before this happening. But God is already positioning the people for what's about to happen in a few hundred years because salvation is about to ride into Jerusalem. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So if we go back to Matthew, the 21st chapter, and he says, go to that village and find this donkey and bring them, and untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them. And he will send them on immediately. Now this took place, <laughs> check it out, so that what was spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Zechariah 9.9 9, that I just read. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. You want to know why he would ride a donkey? He all, the, the kings or the, uh, the leaders of a community or a city or a group of people always came on a horse when they were going to battle. But when they were coming in peace, they rode a donkey. He said, I'm coming in peace. I've got something to give you. I've got something to share with you. But I'm coming to Jerusalem. Now watch this. He's coming from the east. And the Bible says, remember this in, the, in, in Ezekiel, he said, and the glory of the Lord came and it filled the temple. Watch this. Who is the glory of the Lord? You know the scripture says that we have all fallen short of the glory of the Lord. You know what that literally means? That none of, none of us could do it like Jesus did it. 
Because Jesus is the glory. <laughs> a son is the glory of a father. Jesus is the glory of the Lord. And as the glory of the Lord, he was the only one who kept the law, the whole law, and didn't break any law. So we have all fallen short. Come on, y'all. Of the glory of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not Jesus. I'm trying every day to be more like him. But I do know this. I'm not him. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not him. I'm not him, but I'm trying. I'm trying to be more like him every day. I want to be like him. And I would like to be able to say that I did everything just like Jesus. But the whole re reality is and the truth is I need him every day because I'm not as good as him. But when I believe him, then his righteousness settles down on me. And he gives me a covering of righteousness from his own right doing so that now when the enemy sees me, the enemy thinks he's looking at Jesus. Because I'm covered in his righteousness, not mine. Are y'all here today? So, he rides the donkey because he's coming in peace. And normally, if the king is coming into town, he comes with an army. He comes with a battalion of people. And watch, just, just watch this. This is really powerful to me. He said, say to the uh, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, even a colt full of donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their cloaks on them, and he sat on the cloaks. Now, the way Matthew reads, it's, it's kind of interesting because... We know he only rode one animal, right? But it sounds like he rode both of them. It's just the way it was interpreted and written. The reality is he did not ride the donkey and the colt at the same time. He, <laughs> he rode the fold, y'all. Come on. You can smile. Smile. I, I'm, yes. <laughs> The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their cloaks on them. See there? And he sat on the cloaks. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees. This is where we get the palms from, and spreading them on the road. And you know what's really interesting to me about this? He's spreading them on the road. They're spreading the tops of the palm. The palm leaves are from the top of the palms. And they lay them and they spread them. Remember when David was going to go to battle? And he said, when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I feel like when Jesus came riding in, you could hear the sound of marching in the tops of the palm trees and God is coming to war. God is coming to do something. God is coming to take over. God is coming to shift everything in society. The whole world is about to be shifted and God is going to make himself known to his people. And so the Bible says that they were shouting. The crowds were going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And he had, when he entered Jerusalem, all the city. Somebody say all the city. Everybody. Everybody in the city was stirred. Everything was messed up. The whole thing was turned upside down. All of the people came out of offices. People came out of homes. People came out of places of shopping, out of the marketplace, everything. They're looking, who is this? Who is this coming into the city? And they said, the crowds were saying, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is really interesting that they cried, Hosanna. 
Somebody say Hosanna. The word Hosanna means one thing, and it says, the word Hosanna, when you would cry Hosanna, you're saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. I recognize who you are, so I cry, Hosanna, save me. Deliver us from this mess that we're in. Hosanna. That's why when we sing songs like, Hosanna in the highest, let our king be lifted high. Hosanna. I don't know about y'all, but I'm crying out, Lord, save Save me, deliver me from the mess I'm in. Let the king be lifted high. Oh, Lord, save me. You're crying out, God, save us, deliver us. This is what the people were doing because they recognized, because Zacharias said, salvation Come on, y'all. Is coming with him. Behold, your king is coming into town. He's coming on a donkey, even the foal of a donkey. And salvation, somebody say salvation. Salvation is with him. So all of this, these are scriptures. you got to understand that any Jewish person of this day and this age and this time would have known all of these scriptures because they're waiting on Messiah. They know these are messianic scriptures. They know these are scriptures speaking about the one who is coming to deliver them. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus making his ride into the city. And all of a sudden, it burst out. Of the people. And you got to understand this. It came from the children first. Uh, Y'all. It came from the children first. The Bible says. That a child shall lead them. There's something. About the naivety of a child. Jesus said. Unless you become. Like a little child. You will in no wise enter the kingdom. What is so powerful about a little child is because they're not cynical. They haven't lived long enough to be cynical yet. They feel something. They recognize something. So they jump up and shout, Hosanna. Hosanna. And the cynical folks are standing back. Well, I don't know. Maybe we should stop them before they get too loud. I mean, I don't know about this. Should we? And the Bible says, Bible says that the people cried, Hosanna. I believe what happened to the children got so infectious that it began to get into the adults. It began to get into the people who were hungry for something different, who were hungry for something to shift. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for something to shift right now. We need a shift in America. We need a shift in the church. We need a shift in the people of God. We need to stop accepting church as normal. We need to come in and make a demand on the Holy Spirit. We need to be coming in here and saying, I'm not just going to sit back and see what happens. Let's see what Bishop brings. Let's see what the praise team brings. No, we need to be coming in here saying, I'm making a demand on the Holy Spirit today. I need Hosanna to show up in this place. I need God to show up in here. I need about 15 or 20 people that would just say, you know what? I'm tired of just coming to church and just seeing church as normal. I want to see the miracles. I want to see the breakout. I want to see the new. I want to see what God is ready to manifest in this season. So I'm tired of just being in church. I want to be in the presence. Hosanna, save us. Would somebody just lift your voice and shout, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, save us. We need him. We need to put a demand on the Holy Spirit. You're the only one that can do it. Not your neighbor, not me, not the musicians. You're the only one that can put the demand. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Somebody says, I'm going to make a demand. (laughs) I'm going to make a demand on the Holy Spirit. 
Because I believe what the children were doing, they were putting a demand on him. They were putting a demand on The Bible says, and Jesus entered the temple area. Watch this. The glory of God entered the temple. I'm going to say it again. The glory of God entered the temple. And I'm going to tell you, when the glory of God comes in the temple, things don't stay the same. You won't be church as usual. When the glory of God comes in, listen, everything that's not like him is going to get thrown out. Attitudes are going to shift. Oh, come on, y'all. Attitudes will shift. Things will change. You will fall on your face. You will get on your knees before the God, and you will declare his holiness, his righteousness, when glory comes in, it changes everything. It shifts how you see God. It shifts how you feel God. There sometimes is even a fragrance that shifts in the atmosphere. There are moments when God comes in in such glory and such power that nobody can stand. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for him to make himself known in this house. I'm ready. And he says, when Jesus entered the temple, that he drove out all those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He said, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer but you're making it a den of robbers. What's this? Here's what they were doing. This is so crazy, but this is, this is what happens in religion. But what happens in religion? They were to bring sacrifices to the Lord. Everybody was coming with their little lambs, their little doves, whatever it was that they were able to afford, and they were bringing it to the Lord. And what was happening was the men who ran the temple and who took care of the sacrifices were going back in the line, looking at the people lined up and said, hang on a second, buddy. Hey, hey, come here. Man, this thing ain't going to cut it. Your little sacrifice here ain't good enough. But we got one that's a little better over here. So if you will give us this one and a little money to boot, we will bring to you a better sacrifice. The money changers. They were exchanging money. They were, if you will, manufacturing and buying sacrifices. Can I help you all with something? My wife nailed it a while ago. You can't determine how somebody else is supposed to praise God. You cannot put your mouth on whether their sacrifice is good enough or not. You cannot look at somebody else and the way they praise God and say, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not supposed to do it like that. Come here now. Let me show you how to really do this. And we take them into some old religious something. Real praisers. Real praisers know how to praise God in a way that will change an atmosphere. And Jesus had to walk in and tell the religious, you can't play games in here anymore. And I feel the Holy Spirit in here saying right now, you can't play games in here anymore because how she worships is how she worships. How he worships is how he worships. And you better stop trying to take their sacrifice and exchange some predetermined mess that you've got and give it to them and tell them how. Jesus turned the tables over. He drove them out. And then, here's the most wonderful little part of this whole story, and I'm almost done. He says, my house is going to be called a house of praise, prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. And those who were blind and those who limped came to him in the temple area, and he healed him. I'm going to tell you, when the glory comes, <laughs> miracles come. 
I'm going to say it again. When the glory comes, miracle comes. When the glory comes, miracles come. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for miracles to walk into this building. I'm ready to see the miracles happen again and again and again. I don't want it to just happen once in a while. I want to see it happen every time we come together. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says, but when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things he's done, there's always religious folks standing around. And the children who were shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David. They became indignant and they said, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, I hear it. Have you never read? And he quotes from Psalm 8. He says, have you never, here's another prophetic utterance from the great David. He says, have you never read from the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. One place it says perfected praise for yourself. It's a perfected praise because it's not a manipulated praise. It's a per perfected praise because it is not a manufactured praise. And he left them and went out of the city and he spent the night there. Hear this. Everybody always says, but when the kings come into the, into the city like this and they come in and they're making a statement, they always bring their armies. And the, all, of the, all of the great theologians and, and different people that I read and all of this stuff in, in preparation, they all said, but Jesus didn't bring an army. And I'm sitting there screaming, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He brought an army. It was an army of praisers. They might have been little kids, but they were his army because the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And you stand still and give God a praise and let him fight the battle. I don't know about y'all, but I feel like there's an army in here today of praisers who want to loose a praise so that the king of kings will come in glory and in power again into the temple so that the glory of the Lord can release miracles and drive the money changers out. Is anybody got a praise in your spirit in here today? Come on and stand everywhere. Somebody give God a radical praise. Come on, give him a radical praise. Come on, give, I mean a radical praise. One that you didn't plan on giving. You just wanted to give. You know, let it come out of your spirit. Let it come out of your heart. Let it come out of your mind. Let it come out of your innermost being. God, we bless your name. We glorify you. We honor you. We magnify you. Holy is your name. Hosanna, save us. Show yourself strong in this place. Show yourself strong in this place. Come on, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hallelujah. 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 There is an army. There is an army that is coming. There is an army, army that is awakening. There is an army, and I'm telling you, I know that we talk about praise and worship a lot. We look at praise and worship. We sing praise and worship. We talk about the songs. We even now have an artistry format called praise and worship. We do all kinds of things centered around praise and worship. But I'm telling you, real praise and real worship is about to come back into the house of the Lord. I'm telling you where there's some real praisers and some real worshipers that are going to come back into the house of the Lord and songs are going to be birthed in the moment. Praise will be birthed in the moment. I don't, know, I don't even understand how we got music to be praise and worship and we left out what real praise and worship is. But praise and worship is not music. Praise and worship is not singing. Praise and worship is not dancing. Praise and worship is not clapping your hands. It is a manifestation of praise and worship when you clap your hands because there has to be a hand clap 
inside the hand clap. There has to be a heart that is motivated beyond just an external movement of some sort. There has to be something that's going on inside you that says, I'm going to give God some glory right now because of something that is happening inside me. I know that God is greater than all this mess out here. Let me just give him a high praise. It's kind of like, it's kind of like being at the, at, at the, uh, at the ball game. Let me just mess with y'all a little bit. Because you ever go to the ball game? I've, I've gone to the ball game. I have. And you ever notice when your team makes a really good play? You don't sit there and go, now, should I shout or should I clap my hands or should I, should I holler or should I? No. You kick your chair over. You jump up. You go to swinging rags. You got your towel, your cowboy towel, and you're swinging. Or whatever team you're a part of. And you're swinging that thing around, and you out there going, yeah! And you're not embarrassed. You're not embarrassed at all. You don't even turn red. You just do it. But in church, when we see God do a miracle, there ought to be something that rises up in the people of God that causes us to jump up, give God a shout, hey! And it ought not to embarrass you. It ought not to make you feel weird. You ought to be grateful that you have a God that is willing to touch you right where you are. Hosanna, save us! Hosanna, save us. Hosanna, save us. I'm not embarrassed to praise him. I'm not embarrassed to jump. I'm not embarrassed to dance. I'm not embarrassed to weep. I'm not embarrassed to cry. I'm not embarrassed to lift my voice. I'm not embarrassed to do something I've never done before because I've got a God who is constantly doing things I've never seen done before. Can you give him one more radical praise in here? Come on, give him a radical praise. Come on, come on. Don't patty cake for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay on your feet. Stand on your feet. I'm done. We got some baptisms uh, to take care of. We have we not, nobody registered, but if somebody wants to get baptized, we have the clothes available and everything is set up for you. If you want to go and get baptized, I mean, I don't know of a better time to get baptized than Palm Sunday. The day that we celebrate the king coming into the house of the Lord. What a great day. And if you have a baby that you want to see dedicated, we can do that as well. I know nobody registered. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to just give him a good praise right there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. If you have your cups... And if you don't have your cup, you can raise your hand and we can get that to you right quick. Hallelujah. As we share in the Lord's table. Hallelujah. Our Father. Somebody say, Our Father. Which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever. Hosanna, 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 save us. Hallelujah. 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 You take the bread. Hosanna. We thank you for what you did for us. Every stripe on your body. You were bruised and you were wounded for us. You bled inside and you bled outside. Indicating to us you've got us covered inside and out. Heal us completely. And we receive it in Jesus' name. You may receive the bread. feel that in here today? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes, indeed. He said that in this cup was a new commandment. It's his blood. He said it's my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. God, help us love in ways we've never loved before. Help us see one another the way you see us. God, help us just to be exactly like you want us to be in the manners of love. It's the only place that your word tells us to be perfect, to be ye perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect in how you love. So, Father, teach us to perfect our love one to another. We receive the love of Jesus right now. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. You may receive the cup. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay on your feet. If you want to pass those cups in, you can pass them in. We're there to take those from you. Hallelujah. This help anybody today? Anybody glad you came today? Hallelujah. Somebody say, Hosanna. Save us. Hosanna. We need you. Hosanna, have your way in this temple in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, we love you today. and We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your long-suffering, your patience with us, God, your forgiveness, your mercy, your grace, how you treat us every day and love on us in spite of all of our shortcomings, our mistakes, our flat out sin. God, you still love us and we thank you for it. We just cry out one more time, Hosanna, save us and we receive it in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he gift you. May he smile upon you, look you full in your face, and cause you to prosper. As you cry, Hosanna, every day of your life, in Jesus' name. I love you all, and I bless you in Jesus' name. Hug somebody today. Go in the grace and the peace of God. Let's give Jesus a great big... Come on, give him a great big praise.
If you're here today and it's your first time and you would like to meet my wife and I, we would love to meet you. We'll go down to this hallway and there's a room down there called the Connect Room. If you want to go there, we would love to meet you and shake your hand. We love you. God bless you. Hug about 7,500 people before you leave, okay? <laughs> that might be somebody twice. I don't know. But <laughs> love you all.